invite you to open your Bibles to Luke 5. In your pew Bibles, it's found on page 1,600. Listen to the word of God from Luke 5. We will begin reading at verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. So I can't really tell this uh, first story without, without throwing my dad under the bus a little bit. So dad, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but dad not only taught us how to fish when we were uh, children and adolescents, he also taught us how to snag. And, and I don't know if any of you remember what snagging was. Uh, it, it's always been uh, a little unethical and, and maybe a little despicable, but I don't think it was always illegal. And so when, when we were young, we would go up to Ruby Creek, which is a little tributary off the, the Pier Marquette River, and there Dad's friend had a, a cabin on a bend in the river, a beautiful place. But in the fall, when the salmon would run, we would stand on the banks of that creek and we would toss a, a weighted treble hook over to the other bank. And we would stand with really stiff rods and, and, and heavy line, and we would yank that line across the creek, hoping that it would hit a salmon. And the salmon were running so thick that it would, pretty predictably, it would hit several salmon over the course of a morning or a day, and we would get 20, 25, 30 pounders. I remember taking great big fillets to my high school teachers uh, uh, back in the day. And, and when we would pull that weighted treble hook, it was about that big. It had a big chunk of lead hanging off the bottom of it. It would fall to the bottom, and you would give it that yank, and it would come up like a bullet across the water. And when it hit the fish, it hit the fish hard, and there were no glancing blows. You got something. And if you hit it wrong, it pulled in like a log. If you hit it right, you had a fight on your hand, and, and it was fun. Well, I, I, I bring up snagging because uh, at, at the same, uh, same time, it, it, it struck me that, uh, that the evangelism methods that we were being taught were, were a little bit like snagging. They were, they were kind of random. You would just throw it out there and jerk. We were taught to stand on some stranger's porch and, 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 and knock on the door and say, if you were to die tonight, and if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Yank! And, 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 and there weren't often glancing blows. I mean, you put a person's eternal destiny in front of that person out of the blue, and, and, and it's a disorienting sort of thing. The, the benefit of, of, of evangelism explosion was that it proceeded immediately to an explanation of, of grace. 
and how it wasn't what we did as human beings that would get us into heaven, but it was what God did on our behalf. But it seemed to rely pretty heavily on, on fear, on, 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 on making that person suddenly jolt into a realization of what may be to come. I tell those stories as, as we, we approach Luke chapter 5 and, and wonder what is the, the best way for us as a, a body of believers to, to be fishers of, of, of human beings, to be catchers of people. How do we go about that today? Is, is it that we need a uh, a barista in the community room with just the right coffee, or do we need more sermons on hell and damnation? Do we need a, a, a millennial pastor with, with stuff in his hair, or, or do, we, do we need old-time religion? Those are some of the questions that, that we're asking as, as we look at what Jesus does with with Peter and some of those other first disciples here in, in chapter 5 of Luke. Chapter 5 is early in the Gospel of Luke. You'll, you'll remember that the, the first couple of chapters are, are the box full of Christmas decorations, right? We, we looked at them not so long ago. We had, we had Zachariah and Elizabeth and Joseph and Mary and, and little babies John and Jesus. We had the, the shepherds in the field by night and the angels in the sky. And then in chapter 3, there's the ministry of John the Baptist, and Jesus goes to be baptized. And in chapter 4, Jesus is, is tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And then he goes off to begin his ministry. He opens the scriptures to Isaiah in the synagogue and, and, and shares one of his first messages there. We read of the casting out of a demon, of Jesus performing miracles, of his being rejected and chased away. And here we are in chapter 5, on the banks of, of, of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, as, as he has already uh, impressed people as, as someone who speaks and teaches with authority, who speaks as we see here the Word of God, and so he has this following, and they are behind him, and he's there on the lake shore wondering how best to communicate with them, and that's where our story begins. And this morning, I want to, I want to take a look as, as we, we think about Jesus and Peter and what's going on here at, at the interaction between the two, starting with, with Jesus and how he relates to Peter, then Peter and, and his response, and, and finally back to, to Jesus again. And the striking thing about, about how this, this story unfolds is is, is what Jesus does at the very beginning. The, the, the first thing that Jesus says to, to Peter, and it's, Peter, I need you. Peter, I, I, I need your help. You have a boat, and I don't. You know how to row. I have to teach. We need to find some way to, to, to do that, and, and, and would you be so kind as to, to row me out into the water and hold me in place so that I can, I can do all this, says the creator of the universe to the Galilean fishermen. And Peter, having been out all night, tired undoubtedly, well, okay. And what strikes me about this is that, that if Jesus had been sent out by the Christian Reformed Church in North America, I think Jesus would have had an SUV and a boat on a trailer. We wouldn't send Jesus out and, and, and leave him having to ask for help, because we don't ask for help. We help. And, and the amazing thing of all this is, is, is how how humanizing Jesus is from the get-go. How, how Jesus invites Peter, even before he calls him to be a disciple, how Jesus invites Peter to, to come along and to help out, to use what he has to advance the, the cause that, that, that Jesus is bringing from God himself. 
It brings to mind that, that scene of, of Jesus with the Samaritan woman in, in the Gospel of John at the well asking her for, for a drink. There the living water asks this woman who he shouldn't be talking with if, if she would give him a drink. I need you, says the Son of God. I need you to, to work with me, to come alongside of me. So Simon agrees to help Jesus even though he'd been out all night fishing. I wonder how much longer he had to sit in the boat listening to Jesus teach as he, he worked the oars, keeping Jesus in place. But it's not done yet. After the teaching is over and after the crowds drift away, Jesus has another request. He, he wants to go fishing. Please, Simon must have thought. Not this, too. He'd been out all night. And yet, Jesus wants him to go, and so Simon complies. He, 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 he goes back to shore, picks up the nets, they go out. And that's when Jesus' second message gets through to him. Not only does, does he want Simon to help him, but Jesus makes it clear that he can provide for him as well. As they pull in nets that are breaking, because of the quantity of fish, as they call out to the others on the shore to come and help out, it dawns on Simon, soon to be called Peter, that, that this person who asks for his help is also a person who is able to supply his every need. And so it sinks in that what is going on is not just another fishing story. What's going on is life-changing. So let's jump over to Simon Peter and try to get into his head a little bit at this point. One of the, the commentators I read made another interesting point about Jesus showing up at this point in time. He, he wrote, Jesus did not show up after a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast. He came to find these men at the end of a long, frustrating working day. After backbreaking labor, he told them to keep on working. The point being that Jesus doesn't always show up in our lives at the most convenient of times. Sometimes it's the worst time. And you can't help but wonder about the voices inside Peter's head when, when Jesus, after he's, 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 he's agreed to go out and, 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 and hold the boat in place while Jesus teaches, when, when Jesus asks to go out fishing, it, it must have occurred to, to Peter that this guy just didn't know anything at all. I mean, clearly he didn't know that the fish during the day would be able to see the nets if they're out there at all, and they'd avoid them. He didn't know that the fish weren't on the move in the day, that they did that at night. He clearly didn't know how tired they all were and how little they wanted to return out to the water to fish. And it must have seemed to Simon Peter like, like, like this guy knew nothing at all. And yet because of that, that authority he had in his teaching, yet because there was something about him, Simon concedes and they go out to fish. And as we read, the catch was incredible. It was, uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those days where the fish bite even before you can throw it in the water. It was that on steroids. And they can hardly get all the fish to shore. And, and, and Simon must be wondering if, if, if he talked with some fishermen down the lake and he got a tip about something that Simon wasn't aware of. But no, clearly that wasn't it. Clearly that wasn't what they were dealing with here. Instead, this, this, this has all the characteristics of something divine. This has all the characteristics of someone who exercises power not only over people, but over creation as well. And so Simon goes from thinking that, 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 that this guy must not know anything at all to thinking he must know everything to, to immediately concluding, and I'm a sinner. 
Think of Isaiah and his vision in Isaiah chapter 6. Woe to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Think of, of, of Moses being commanded to take off his sandals as he sees the burning bush because he's in a holy place. Think of Gideon threshing grain in the wine press out of fear for the Midianites when God appears and tells him that he has to go and he says, no, I'm not worthy. Here we have Simon with the recognition of, of, of the person who is in front of him and the holiness that that person represents and he realizes that he's a sinner. He realizes he's unworthy. Leave me. Go away. Instead of save me, Simon assumes that the presence of, of Jesus Christ will do him harm. And so we find Simon Peter on his knees before the one who had given him the biggest catch of his life saying, go away, I'm a sinner. There's no catalog of, of Peter's sins here. We don't know if he cheated on his wife or was given to drinking a bit too much. Maybe he didn't pay his taxes. Or maybe he tried to sell suckers as sea bass. We don't know. What we do know is that Jesus never tried to catch a perfect fish. Ever. You know what I mean? Like the, the rich young ruler, if ever there was a perfect fish, if ever there was someone that you should adjust your bait for, if ever there was someone who, who you, you wanted to make sure you could nail, but Jesus let him go. Instead, what, what Jesus was after were, were people who had this sense that Simon exhibits here that I am unworthy, that I don't deserve this, that I shouldn't even be here. And those are the people that, that Jesus is interested in. Those are the people that Luke will address throughout the rest of this gospel as we, as we begin to follow Jesus to the cross in the coming weeks and celebrate the season of Lent together. Those are the people, Luke tells us, that Jesus consistently went after. And so we're back to Jesus after the yo-yo-like experience of Peter who goes from annoyance to adoration to wonder and fear. And the first thing that Jesus says to him is do not fear. We come back to that fear thing again that we know is a powerful tool, we know it can be used to get a certain kind of reaction in a certain kind of time, but it seems to be a tool that Jesus is unusually, un unwilling to, to use with, with people who understand their sinful condition, with people who understand that they are in the presence of the Holy One, that they don't deserve to be there, Jesus does not grind it in their face or grind their faces in their sin. Instead, he communicates the fact that God is kindly disposed toward us in his grace. We need not fear if we understand the realities that we see when we have this encounter with Jesus because God, God wants to take care of us. And instead of focusing on Peter's unworthiness and cataloging Peter's sins, he suggests that Peter might still be useful. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. It's also interesting, or at least I think so, that, that Jesus doesn't say, don't be afraid. You're going to heaven after you die and not to hell. Have you ever noticed that? Maybe it's, it's just an impression I have, but it seems to me that when Jesus talks about, about punishment, about hell, about damnation, more often than not, the people he's talking to are religious people. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. But when he talks to people who are sinners, who understand that they are sinners, Jesus is more likely to talk about the invitation and love of God, his, his, his invitation and his grace for us. And then there's a whole bit about becoming fishers of people. 
Really, this is the, the point of the whole story. Jesus doesn't call his first followers first and foremost so that they can, they can go to heaven when they die, although that's clearly a part of his message. It's what he taught, and, and it's fascinating to read in that story of the, the resurrection of Lazarus, how, how even before Jesus calls Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus' sister Martha understands Jesus' teaching about about the resurrection to eternal life. It's a part of what Jesus taught. It's a a part of, 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 of the message. But when Jesus calls us to follow him, what Jesus leads with is for us to do something, for us to be occupied in in his kingdom work. What Jesus offers here is the opportunity for Peter to give his life to someone greater than anything in his life. We may assume that someone picked up the fish and put away the boats and nets, but what Luke wants us to know is that once Jesus showed up and made this incredible invitation, nothing else mattered. And it wasn't fear that drove Peter, it was life that drove Peter. The life represented in the teachings of of Jesus, the life represented in these these, these miraculous occurrences, the life represented in the integrity of Jesus himself, it, it seemed to be a seamless whole. And Peter, in seeing and recognizing that, wanted a part of it. Jesus was offering him that opportunity, and, and he simply couldn't walk away from it, back to his boat and his nets. In our Bibles, the word that is always translated as fishers of men or fishers of people doesn't really have the word fish in it. It means to catch or to capture, but not in the sense of of, of catching or capturing something and and throwing it in the bottom of the boat and letting it die. Instead, what, what Jesus was teaching Peter to do was more of a catch and release sort of program, Jesus was offering Peter uh, instructions on, on how to pe- pull people from the, the toxic ponds in which we all swim and release them into true life. And Peter, if you'll forgive the pun, was hooked, not by fear and not by the, the perfectly selected be- bait that, that, that Jesus had prepared for him, but by the conviction that Jesus was the real thing and that Jesus had something for him to do. The teaching, the authority, the miracles, they all fit together. And Peter would give anything and did give everything to be a part of that. And so Peter turned around on his, his past life and walked away from it to follow Jesus. You know, it's always hard to to come to the end of one of these stories and try to draw conclusions, isn't it? I mean, there, there, there are so many things that we can say to get ourselves off the hook, as it were. I mean, those were Jesus' disciples. That was something that happened in the New Testament. That was, that was for them, and, and maybe a little bit of it is for us, but not clearly not, not all of it. And so as we think about what Jesus is trying to teach us, what Luke wants us to understand, I I think there are are, are three things that we can take away here. First, you've got the title of the sermon. We are all called to follow. So many of us see and imagine ourselves as, as the captains of our own ships, as the creators of our own destinies, we, we live in a culture that tells us that all the time. We come to believe it most of the days of the week without even thinking about it. But that hymn, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. I mean, that's, that's where it starts. Each and every day with that awareness, with that consciousness, that whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever we set out to accomplish, we do so following Jesus, first of all. Second, Jesus calls us to join him in his work. We are called in the first instance to use the unique gifts that God has given each and every one of us to serve him. And as we look in the stories of the Gospels about the disciples, about their different characters, about their different personalities, their different giftings, it's not hard to see in our own congregation how we're made up of people with different, with different gifts, with different ways of serving God. 
It doesn't all have to be the same, but it all has to be something. I mean, any body part that is not being used is a detriment to the rest of the body. It, it, it slows the body down. And if God has called us to follow Jesus Christ, he's called us to be engaged. He's called us to deploy those gifts that he's given for his kingdom. And if we are not, then there is something wrong. Finally, we're called to repeat the cycle of what we see here. We're called to look for ways to invite people to join the task. So often we see ourselves as a fish on a stringer or, or a fish in a bucket waiting for that last day when, when we can live forever in heaven. But once again, the, the point of the fishing was not to wind up on a stringer or in a bucket. The point was to learn how to be catchers of people, to learn how to be part of an enterprise that carries out the mission of God here on this planet, to bring others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to invite others to, to walk along with us, to help out where they can, even if they're not disciples, even before they're disciples, so that they understand that we're not high and, and, and mighty looking down on everybody else trying to show them how great we are, but that like Jesus, we are humbly looking for ways to carry out God's wishes. And anyone who can help in any way is welcome to do so. Well, those are some thoughts on, on what the passage says, on, 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 on what we need to do as we, as we think about this story of, of Jesus and the fish. And the question that remains for all of us is, how am I called to follow? How are you called to follow? How will we respond? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for fish stories and for all the fun they are, for the experiences that, that, that Jesus was able to be a part of as a human being, for the way that they connect with our own lives and experiences. Father, we thank you for a bigger picture, too, for not just fish stories, but for stories of life, for stories of, of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be sons and daughters of the King. Lord, as we follow Jesus through the Gospel of Luke, we pray that you will help us all to be ready to, to wrestle with issues of calling and life and lifestyle and, and all the disturbing things that we find in your word. We pray that you'll help us not to fear. We know that you love us. But we pray that you'll help us to be challenged. Help us to examine our lives. Help us to see the value of what you offer and help us to be ready to leave anything and everything behind so that we can follow you. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.